Yeah. So I work for a company called Start9, and um, I'm really happy that this uh, is simultaneously relevant and also not really been discussed here at all because this has been very this has been a very academic conference and it's not not knocking that um, and it's been focused on software which is great um, but it's not everything right and ultimately I guess the point I'm trying I will, the overarching point of what I'm trying to communicate here is that it often doesn't matter how good the software is and how how watertight all your protocols are and how much um, you know, how many adversarial conditions you've taken into account and how theoretically everything works if we don't own any of our devices, which is increasingly the case. And I mean that in the, the Richard Stallman sense of how free are they. So you're running fantastic software, but what are you running it on? Is it a Microsoft Windows machine? Is it an Apple Mac? How much do you really trust these things? And um, at what point does that become the low-hanging fruit for, I want to increase my privacy. I'm using, you know, Wasabi wallet. I'm going through hundreds of rounds. I'm super private right now, but my computer's owned, right? Like, there's, a, there's a, some big tech company that knows everything that's going on with my computer. So, and even if, you, even if you go Linux, what about the processor? Does it have a backdoor in it? These are concerns, right? So, I'll talk a little bit about what we make at Start9, which is a personal server. Uh, called and it runs on uh, the operating system we make called Embassy OS. And what this allows you to do is run Bitcoin nodes, run Lightning nodes, the whole Bitcoin stack, but other stuff too. And basically, the point I would make is that privacy, which is the name of this talk, privacy is a subset of sovereignty. If you're not sovereign in your devices and what you're doing in the first place, you can only get privacy as either a temporary permission or as a service. So everyone's super excited about Apple at the moment because Apple have just said, we're going to do encrypted cloud backups with end-to-end -end encryption. That it should just demonstrate how, m how little sovereignty we have because we're waiting to be granted it by a powerful third party for them to say, okay, we'll allow you some privacy now. And everyone will celebrate it, even respected cryptographers. Um, will will celebrate it, even though there's no even even on the software level, there's no way to verify that it's doing what Apple say it's doing. We can't even verify it, and in my opinion, that that is very easily, arguably, a net negative, because if you think you're private when you're not, you're going to act in a much worse way than if you realized you were public. I you always use the analogy of if I give you magic invisible clothes and I uh, tell you that no one can see you when you wear these clothes and you go to the store and you steal a bunch of stuff and you come back and it turns out everyone could see you. I know that you wouldn't, I'm not advocating acting like that, but I'm saying you wouldn't have done that. You would have behaved differently if you'd have been aware that you were public. So bad privacy is worse than no privacy in almost all cases. So where am I going with this? The point is, if you, if you can't verify the software, we all know that's bad. No one's going to use a closed source Bitcoin client, I hope. But they might use something that isn't a, a reproducible build. And they're almost definitely going to use it on, on, a, on a phone or some operating system that isn't fully open source. And even if they go the extra length to, to compile their own OS, what, what hardware are they running it on? So back to the point of what, I'm, what, I'm, what we're making here at Start9. We've there's been a whole load of, uh, for, for a lot of people, you know, we're saying run a Bitcoin node. This is a mantra in the Bitcoin space. You need to run a node. Why? Because, I don't know, just run it. It's not a good enough reason. The reason you should run a node is because it's useful and you increase, every, as stuff gets built on top of the Bitcoin network, some of this stuff is privacy enabling tools as well. If you don't have your own node, you're not going to be able to do this stuff properly. Wasabi makes some pretty genius workarounds with um, block filters. Um, but nonetheless, if you're doing this stuff and you're being serious about it and you're having an adversarial mindset, you definitely need to be in a great degree of confidence about what's going on on the underlying operating system and on the underlying hardware. So we're telling people, run nodes. If you run a Bitcoin node, you'll be able to run a Lightning node. If you run a Lightning node, you'll be able to run messaging apps like Sphinx that use Lightning. Uh, it's fun. Do it. It's useful. Um, but if you want... The problem is you have things like block explorers, right? And there are public block explorers. And if you ever use one of these things, you are completely 
beholden to the policies of the person running the node underneath that block explorer. So you just can't do it, right? So we, t we, we make a, an ability for people to, to have uh, an instance of mempool.space that sits on top of your own Bitcoin node where if you're doing a coin join and the coin join hasn't confirmed in the blockchain yet and you want a nice graphical UI to look at, you plug in the transaction and you sit there and you watch and you wait for it to confirm. Whereas if you don't have your own mempool space instance and you're impatient and you just put that transaction into a public block explorer, yeah, maybe you're going to use Tor or something to help Ma to help mask it or something, but you know who? Why do that? Why not just have your own block explorer? So increasingly, there's a need to self-host all this stuff. But the importance of doing that in a sovereign manner means at some point you have to take on the hard problem, which is hardware itself. So we just came up with the Embassy Pro, which I mean, who's aware of all the Node projects in the Bitcoin space, right? You've got you've got you've got a uh, Raspberry Blitz, you've got Umbrel, you've got all these projects that started up and said, we need people to run nodes, we're going to make it really, really cheap, don't worry, you're not going to have to spend more than 75 bucks. Okay, the Raspberry Pi is a thousand bucks now, but... <laughs> like, so, is anyone aware of these kinds of projects? So, we have a lot of people that run nodes, and they're very proud of doing it, and, you know, so we... Um, if I can be a little boastful here, we were the first company that came along and actually did it seriously and didn't just make a glorified Docker compose file and said, here you go, you're now a sovereign Bitcoiner running a Raspberry Pi that you have no idea how to use. Um, <laughs> so, so we started on the Raspberry Pi like everyone else, but then we partnered with Purism. Does anyone know who Purism are? So they made the first Linux phone, and it was a phone with physical switches where you could turn off microphone, you could turn off camera. So this is serious, right? It's not a software disable switch that might do what it says it does. No, if you want to disconnect the microphone on Purism, Librem 5, I think it is, switch. It's off, and that's reliable, right? So they came out with their mini PC, which is uh, it's an Intel Nook form factor. It has uh, an Intel processor in it, but they've done hours and hours of research, and they figured out how to disable this Intel management engine, which is inside the processor. It's a backdoor. As far as I know, it's never been knowingly exploited, but you cannot fundamentally, on a deep level, trust your own device if the processor itself has a backdoor in it. So we're now selling a node that comes with a plug-and-play Bitcoin stack, and I'm going to go into why that's so important in a minute. But we have hardware you can trust now. There is a, it's a powerful piece of hardware. It's not a toy or Raspberry Pi anymore. It's a 32 gigabyte of RAM, 4.9 gigahertz processor with you know, incredibly fast two terabyte NVMe in it, which will probably increase in the future. But this non-backdoored processor means uh, the meme Matt made about it was uh, you know, radical disintermediation all the way down to the hardware level, because you've got to go down to the bottom. You can't be building, you can't, you can't add privacy on after the fact like you can if you just take it and make yourself sovereign from the very beginning. If you're sovereign from the beginning, privacy becomes the default. And we know in Bitcoin that's really hard. Bitcoin is not private by default. It's public by default. It has to be. The trade-offs in the other direction are not palatable to us. We're not Monero heads or Zcashers because what's the point? I can use other things privately. Bitcoin is not, never fundamentally was about privacy, but if it's going to be something that is remotely attainable, the people that are embarking in it need to be in control of their own devices and need to be using software that is properly verifiable, you know, and just the whole stack needs to be taken into consideration. So the next thing I want to talk about is how via privacy does require a certain amount of respect for privacy in the entire community. We are all kind of responsible for each other's privacy and in, in a very direct way, right? If you do a round of coin joins and everyone else in the coin join has no idea what to do after the coin join, they will ruin not just their privacy but yours too. So this is a, com a common problem with something like Samurai or Whirlpool. You're mixing with four other people, right? and maybe one or two of them is using Samurai on their phone and they don't even have a node, in which case you have no, no expectation of privacy at all. And the whole thing becomes a glorified VPN, in my opinion. Like if someone's telling you, use a VPN, it's private. It's not, really. Like, it's good if you're going on a website where the website says, oh, you're based in America, you can't watch this TV show. So you turn on a VPN and say, I'm in Canada now, and they let you watch the TV show. That's not going to thwart the NSA, is it? 
right? <laughs> so a VPN is good for certain things, it's not good for other things. So you have certain privacy techniques in Bitcoin as well. Some of them are really good and some of them are pretty crap. So in my opinion, something like Samurai, you have, you know, if you have a, a, a putrid company like BlockFi that are banning, you know, certain UTXOs, you might stick it through Samurai once and then say, oh, I've got nothing to do with that and you'll probably be all right. But I wouldn't say, you know, if your threat model is a lot more serious than just getting around uh, some KYC for an exchange, then you're going to want to use something better than that. But yeah, so there, to go back to the original point, you need, you need the whole, you need a cooperative behavior from everyone else engaged in the coin join, which in the case of Samurai is four other people, right? If you're using Whirlpool on Sparrow, that is, it's four other people, assuming you don't do any future mixes. That's not a lot. So that's risky, right? So to zoom out from that, there's so many other, there's so many other areas in which that becomes more subtly still the same case, where the less people respect their own sovereignty in Bitcoin, the more it affects your sovereignty. So the more time, the more people run nodes, the more people use Bitcoin in a sovereign manner, the better it gets for everyone else. Running your own node is great. If you're, the, if you're one of three people running Bitcoin nodes in the world, Bitcoin's fucked. That's just the truth of it. You n other people need to do it and they need to be incentivized to do it. And it's not, it, we have to be careful with our messaging. We don't tell people, run a Bitcoin node, it's you need to do it for the good of the network because that's not true either. If, the, if Bitcoin needs people to run nodes out of the goodness of their heart, then we're not going to do very well. We need people to run nodes because they have no alternative and because the, the benefit of doing so is clear to them. So I've already mentioned the things we offer, right? So you want to be able to run your own block explorer. Never use public block explorers. There's no good reason to do it. All you're doing is betraying your own privacy. You're not necessarily getting reliable information and you're creating, you're creating just a honeypot, right? I trust Blockstream. I trust the guys at mempool space, but that doesn't mean I'm going to trust them with important information. Why do that if you don't have to? Main, I would assume that the only reason anyone ever does it is because it's, it's a pain in the ass setting up a, a block explorer. No, they, they, the, the, we don't even need to fork it as far as I know. Well, it's just put, a, put in a Docker image. And so, I mean, I'm going to go to the marketplace here. So we're going to take a quick look at the Start9 marketplace. I mean, the, the difference is, like, you can run, you can connect to a Bitcoin Core node run by someone else, or you can run Bitcoin Core on your own computer. That's, it's exactly the same uh, deal here. So what we've done is we've created a complex uh, dependency management system where all of the hard stuff about running a Bitcoin node and then running a Lightning node on top of it that's probably configured uh, and then running a mempool instance and you know running even services like ghost and agora is it where you can host files behind a lightning paywall and you can s you can send someone a file and they need to pay 500 sats to the lightning node sitting on your own machine to to view the file very very simple service and really effective um <coughs> we have all these services and the main thing that it helps with that I'm super stoked about with this whole project is that we have so many we have such need of everyone else using Bitcoin in a sovereign manner because it helps us personally when they do that we need to make it really really simple trivial it needs to work and unfortunately I can't demonstrate it here I was gonna do so but Tor is just too unreliable and my I can only access my node over Tor at the moment so there is a bit of a learning curve when it comes to using these things because they're only accessible over local area network or over Tor for now. But we just came up with the Embassy Pro, which I've already mentioned is this powerful node running thing with, with the Intel management engine disabled. Now that we've got that out of the way, the next project is make it accessible over ClearNet. And how are we defining that? We were defining it as D DNS plus SSL or something, right? Yeah. So. Once we can do, because this is the hard part, right? We've made it as simple as possible and we have incredible support. That's what we're known for. Basically, if you buy an embassy from us or let's be real, if you just download it from GitHub and install it on some random hardware you have, we earn nothing from it, but we'll still help you use it. 
the hardest, the, it's basically as user friendly as it gets. You, you install the OS, you create a password for yourself, you learn what the LAN connection is, you click on Bitcoin, you click install. And then if you install something else like LND or CLN or mempool space or one of the other, you know, 30 tools we have, because we've got all the LND tools, you know, every, every three days there's a new tool to install for LND. All of these things will automatically configure themselves to work with the whole stack. And all you need to do is just say, okay, configure it. And if you don't know what you're doing, I accept the default configuration. It's all incredibly well written. It's incredibly solid. And it's still too much for 95% of people, which is why we have the support we have. And we're very well known for giving premium support. Now that we've got the bulk of it out of the way and we've got a high-powered device, the main low-hanging fruit for how we can make this accessible for the majority of people is no one knows how to use LAN or Tor. That's just not how you use the internet as an everyday person. You need to go to a dot .com. So that comes with a whole load of trade-offs, right? The minute you go away, like Tor just solves every problem magically and the price you pay for that is it's really slow and unreliable. And LAN, you could do the whole thing over LAN. You would just need to set up a wire guard, right? So that your local area network was always accessible. But we want to do more than that. This is to, to branch out a little bit from Bitcoin. We're talking about sovereignty as a whole. So we're talking about hosting files. We're talking about run, hosting your own matrix server. These things are incredible. If you, can, if you can host your own matrix server, which I do, then you can have your whole family talking, internally communicating. You have your own file browser, which is cloud storage. You can make accounts for other people. You can do the whole Uncle Jim model, which means it's not Google providing these services for my family anymore. It's me. I'm the guy in my family that runs a Bitcoin node, runs a Lightning node, and I do so in a way where I preserve my family's sovereignty as well. And in the instances which I might learn something that they might not want, obviously if they're using the cloud storage I, I run on my embassy, they have their own account with their own password and I can't see anything. But even if that's weird for them, they're a teenager now, they're using their matrix, they're using my matrix server to communicate with their friends. If they want their own thing, then it's not like, oh, this isn't really private, but Google get to see it, whatever, same for everyone. No, it's my dad might be reading my messages. I need, I need to get my own one. Like, and that's great, right? It, it's, it becomes a pathway to adulthood, which is what the whole thing is. And that was the point, that was the overarching point I wanted to make this whole talk about, which was, I saw Svetsky the other day tweet beautifully that privacy is not a human right. You can't look at it that way. It's a responsibility. If it's a human right, that's basically you saying, I want other people to figure out how to make sure I have this thing. And if you do that, you'll never actually have it. Privacy is a thing where you've got to say, I'm going to be private. Why? Because fuck you, that's why. And that's, if you do that, you, you need to assert it. It's fucking America. You say, independence was not requested. It was declared. We declared independence. So you can decide, I am going to be private. And that's going to be a, a that's going to require a lot of responsibility. It's something that is your responsibility. If it's your responsibility, that means you're going to have to learn how to do stuff. You're going to have to get out of your comfort zone, and you're going to have to be thoughtful, and you're going to have to persevere. So, we've made a tool that says, if you ideologically understand it, right? I'm not trying to. If anyone's sitting here saying, "Oh, if you've got nothing to hide," like this is a privacy conference, right? So I assume nobody is that ideologically naive that privacy is something that is only necessary if you're a criminal or something like that. Or, right, everyone here is aware that that's stupid. But most of the planet, we sort of demonstrated that privacy is not dead in people's hearts. People actually respect it. As much as they might tell us, you know, Mark Zuckerberg might say privacy is dead, even though I have, I've bought every single property, you know, in a, in a border around my house and just to make sure no one is anywhere near me, I want my privacy. But it's dead for you guys. People like privacy. And that's why Apple came out with what they came up with. Because people don't want, you know, taking a picture of their two-year-old having a bath. They don't want that going unencrypted to a server where a bunch of Apple employees can just look at it because it's gross and creepy and weird. And it's the same with your finance. Like, we need privacy. It's perfectly justifiable. The issue is that people are just sort of, it's technically beyond them. So that's why we made what we made because we need, we don't have Wasabi on here yet. We don't have a coin joining solution on here yet. We'll probably add the Ronin Dojo stack um, yeah, Sparrow is coming. You can connect a Sparrow wallet to the node here. I'll be honest, it could be a little unreliable because ElectRS or, you know, just Tor in general. But Sparrow is now accessible as a web interface, right? Which means it can run as a service 
on the embassy, which means you access Sparrow via Tor or LAN, but Sparrow itself accesses the Bitcoin node on running on the same machine. So it can just do it over localhost, right? So at that point, that's good. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of Sparrow, but it's still good. So this is what this is what we need to do. We need to create an you need to create a tool that enables other people to use the software in a way that benefits everyone, especially yourself. And that tool needs to be simple and trivial enough to use that comes with enough support that you can get people over the hump, right? Like you can't, the, the liberation that comes with like the motor vehicle or the second amendment or any of these things necessarily implies that, you know, driving a car or using a firearm is something that can reasonably done, be done by most people. It's not impossible, right? Being self-sovereign when it comes to tech is beyond 99% of people. So someone has to come along and say, it's easy enough now to run a Bitcoin node, to run a Lightning node on top of that, to run another Lightning node on top of that. There's a different implementation. To run a chat service, to host a matrix server, to host your own password management, to host your own cloud storage. All of the things, I mean, I'm going to go to the all tab. Look, I mean, we even host Gitty, which is uh, a, a way to easily, you know, it's a substitute for GitHub. It's a self-hosted, uh, you know, Git, a way to self-host your own Git repositories. And you can mirror stuff. So I've mirrored the whole Bitcoin Core repository. I've mirrored the whole Embassy OS repository. That means that's redundancy, right? So if Microsoft, if and when they turn bad, we can just laugh at them. If they want to start screwing around with github.com slash Bitcoin slash Bitcoin, if they want to start doing that, it doesn't matter. There's thousands of embassy users, and they all, the first thing we told them to do was go and mirror the Bitcoin repository. So Microsoft, do your worst. We have redundancy now, right? So I'm just going to go to the all tab and show you this. So we have uh, uh, a photo view that sits on top of file browser, which is the base of the cloud storage stack. Photo view allows you to, you know, it's got facial recognition, but don't be scared because you're hosting it yourself. Don't worry, <laughs> it's not the FBI. Uh, you've got Spark Wallet, which sits on top of Core Lightning, which allows you to, which you can connect mobile apps to, and then you actually have real Lightning on the go. It's not Moon, it's not Phoenix, it's not any of these sort of halfway houses to using Lightning that aren't custodial, but or a privacy disaster, right? And a permission, you're still requiring permission from a third party. No, you can actually have lightning on your phone. Mastodon, as we all know what Mastodon is, right? Yeah, it's, it, running it over Tor, I'm gonna be honest, is not the greatest experience, but things are gonna change because the whole process of next year for us as a company is figuring out ClearNet. And once we do that, everything is gonna go into overdrive. And yeah, a whole bunch of other apps. Basically, you can host your own BTC Pay server. It's a fantastic way. If you want to accept Bitcoin as a merchant, you can install this. And it's all of the services have been tweaked when necessary. So BTC Pay server, you can tell it under the hood, I want to use my LND node, or I want to use my CLN node, actually. Actually, I want to use a, someone else's LND node. In fact, I don't want to use Lightning at all. You can configure all these stuff in a, in a very simple way. And you have... Uh, this is a super cool service I really like, actually. Burn after reading. It's like a self-hosted paste bin that will only ever work once. So it's, it's the James Bond of paste bins. Obviously, you can't stop whoever it is from screenshotting the message you send them. But if you send someone a message via burn after reading, only one person will ever be able to open that Tor link, and then it's over. So yeah, you had, you had a quick question. You mentioned about the LAN, the local area network. So, so I mean, local area network, it just, forgive me if I mess up the definition a bit, but you're, it just means you're on the same network as your embassy, simple. So you can either tunnel into your network and then be effectively on it using something like WireGuard, which is coming as a service. Essentially, yeah. So I if you've ever gone to your router panel and typed in, if you ever like needed to change your Wi-Fi password or something and you've typed in 192.168.1.1 or something, everyone's done that, right? Like, so that's, you're accessing, you're not going over the internet for that. You're, you're going within your own internal home network. That's why you're typing in just a, a, a local IP address. 
dot locals are things that are within you know that are being organized by your own home router you can unplug the internet from it and you'll still be able to access it so it's faster than anything you'd ever do otherwise but you can only do it at home which obviously is incredibly limited but it's not bad at the same time it's actually pretty useful yeah yeah so your alternative when you're away is find a way to tunnel into your home network or use Tor obviously both of those are technically very challenging for most people, so it's not a viable long-term solution. Like, this whole thing will never move beyond a sort of niche enthusiast area. But it's also not, un unless we can, uh, you know, figure out clear net, but it's also not only for amateurs and noobs, right? Like, every high-level Bitcoin dev I've shown this OS to is like, this is going to save me so much time. Can I have one? Like, because Matt and the founders, Matt and Aiden and Keegan, probably, I, I can't remember if he was part of this, but the reason this whole project came into being is because they're all devs. Aiden is a fantastic, deep computer scientist, and they were setting up LND to run on top of Bitcoin, and it took them forever. And they're like, this is never going to work. No one is going to do this. It's too difficult. If I can't do it, <laughs> then who the hell is ever going to figure out how to configure? No, no noob is going to configure LND to run on top of Bitcoin Core if I can't do it in a day. Sorry, yeah, go for it. Yes, but my perception is that now I have to trust you guys with the privacy configurations mm -hmm. that you guys have like, figured for me. So how do I verify that? these configs are what I want, right? It's a great question, and it's, there's no simple answer to it. And it just points to the fact that there are trade-offs with everything you do. So we're not selling closed source software, right? We're not just sh shipping yeah. you, you know, stuff that you can't rebuild. So, and we have wide, uh, you know, I, I've, I've written my own instruction guides for how to install Ubuntu, how to compile this whole OS for yourself. We lose money when you do it, but it's, it's just an essential part of what well, I mean, not anymore. The OS is totally free now. But you do have, if you don't have the ability to verify code, I mean, you, the, well, the same argument could even be made of you have to trust the Bitcoin core developers, right? Unless you have the ability to review the C++, you have to trust the people that wrote it. But in reality, that's not what's happening, right? N most people that use Bitcoin core and celebrate the fact that it's open source are not able to review the source code. They just know that other people can review yeah. the source code. And their heuristic is, well, I trust that guy, and Peter Todd would probably have written a tweet if there was something shit going into Bitcoin Core, and he didn't. So, like, and this controversial change, I don't even understand it, but it's probably fine, and only John Carvalho hates it, and I don't really like him. Like, so, <laughs> like, you ha these are the heuristics so people use. Like They're not perfect, right? So it's a social heuristic. Like, if something's yeah. wrong with your, with your uh, setup, someone on Twitter should be able to talk yeah. about it in a thread or something. Yeah, so yeah. Y there are no, it's just a whole bunch of social heuristics, generally, unless you're literally able to review the code. And there are, there are elements to that too, because you can have people that develop software in a way where it's like, okay, it's technically open source, but I cannot make head or tail of this code. It's almost maliciously written to prevent me from being able to understand it. Yeah. And there's code which is well written and says, we want to have people audit our code. We have the intention of people reading it, where it'll be, it'll be well commented, it will be logically laid out in a way where other people can review it and actually have a, a chance in hell of figuring out what it does. So we are the latter. We, are, we want people to look at our software, we want people to review it, we want people to trust us, but we don't want people to have to trust us, right? So a big problem is the marketplace. We host the marketplace. So you have to trust us when you download Bitcoin Core, right? Sorry, go for it, Chris. Chris works for Start92, I should say. If you're, if you're knowledgeable enough to ask that question, like, should I trust this privacy config, uh, we encourage you to go and just read the config and start, you know, just go in our community. There's like 1,400 people in there and just start asking like, what does this config thing do? What does this config thing do? What does this config thing do? And you really don't have, like, you, you don't have to trust us at all. I mean, if you, if you want to trust us, you can, but we encourage you not to do that. We encourage you to learn how everything works. And we have, again, we have hundreds of people who can teach you how everything works. Yeah, so it's don't trust, verify. We encourage you to verify. We're not making it hard for you to do that, but there is the technical reality of, you know, if you want to get to the top of the mountain, you're going to have to get up the mountain. So if you want to review the source code, you're going to have to learn how the source code 
actually works. Otherwise, you're just going to have to take people's word for it. And that's not that unreasonable to do, I will say. Like, if there's a, we are well known in the, we are increasingly well known in the Bitcoin community. If we did something malicious, you could probably expect to hear about it. And there would be a big stink about it. So, the bigger, the more known we get, the, 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 more, the more of a reputational, uh, because reputation is a form. Yeah, uh, reputation is a form of proof of work. It really is. Like, if you have a good reputation, it means you did a lot of good work. But the, it's not as solid as Bitcoin, right? Like, the, the, the CEO can change. A company can suddenly move all their operations to another country. And, yeah, like, to the Bahamas. <laughs> like they were trustworthy before that. <laughs> they were totally fine before that. <laughs> Well, we want privacy for the individuals. We don't want privacy for the people in ch in charge of stuff. And B but Bitcoin isn't by default private anyway. And if you're if you're an exchange moving eighteen thousand bitcoins, good luck using Wasabi to coin join that. Like, <laughs> is like we yeah like that's kind of why governments and politicians are so hostile to Bitcoin, right? Is because they can't operate covertly anymore. If a politician ran a presidential campaign and raised a hundred million dollars in Bitcoin to this Bitcoin address. We're going to know like, if they ever spend any of it, and they don't like that. <laughs> no, so anyway, you have a question. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, slightly, a little bit of a tangent, they're more like long-term strategy for start nine questions than specifically what you're addressing. Um, I'm a customer, very much like the, the products. Um, two questions I have about the, where, you, where you're going, if you guys can answer these. Um, uh, there, there is a train of thought, and I'm not sure where I sit on this, but there's a train of thought thinking, what does like a photo browsing app, um, maybe you know s some of the um, password storage things like that? What are they doing sitting next to your uh, Bitcoin applications? You know, is there a risk there? I, I, yeah, I know you can argue both ways about that, but no, I'm just sure, like like what your philosophy on that is, um, because some people have the you know I think Umbral is far more guilty of this than you guys are, where you know you haven't got anything to control your your furry lights on there at the moment, but I guess with the marketplace that's that's possible. Um, so what, what's your thoughts about that conundrum where someone can make the argument that, hey, you know, these things have no place existing on the same system, docking container or no, um, that your Bitcoin um, stuff is sitting on? Yeah, it's a question of personal responsibility. So if you're an education, I guess, we are obligated to educate people that there is a risk doing these sorts of things. With every service you install, you increase the attack surface, right? So get two embassies is basically the boilerplate solution for it's people that are worried about very that. very financially it, profitable answer. Yeah. Well, no, because they can be free. Everyone's, who hasn't got eight Raspberry Pis in their house right now? Like, who hasn't got 65 SD cards sitting on their desk at home? Who do, you're not a Bitcoiner unless that's the case, I'm sorry. I'm guilty of that. All right, cool. I just want to add that we're not going to tell you what your threat model is. Um, you know, everyone that runs Embassy OS is going to have a different threat model, and they're going to need to um, figure out, ultimately, they'll have to take responsibility for this themselves. Um, we're go yeah, as, as Lex said, we're going to try and educate you, uh, you know, as well as possible, but um, yeah, at some point, you know, if you have huge amounts of Bitcoin, you know, uh, in, in, in a lightning node or something like that, uh, you, you probably don't want a ton of other stuff on there. And remember, it's a Bitcoin node, right? You don't store your, your private keys on the node. Yes, you do for Lightning because it's necessarily a hot wallet, but, you know, we're telling you to get a cold card, right? So the Spectre is a service. Like, this was the one service I've packaged so far. So I'm very proud of that particular service being on there. Thank you, Chris. Standing on the shoulders of giants with this one. Um, Spectre, there's a, a, an incredible... Uh, can, can I access the instructions for the service and just... Give a demo. Yeah, I can. So this is a long set of comprehensive instructions about if you have a cold card, this is how you use it with this service. If you have a Trezor, this is how you use it because, well, you know, or air gap versus USB connection. So we're telling you don't, it's a Bitcoin core node. It's not a hardware wallet exactly. So 
you're using it to verify things and to keep yourself private. You're not using it to store your main HODL stash, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, there is always that solution of just keep your Bitcoin stack on a separate embassy. And that's also lean as well, that you can do that on a Raspberry Pi. And the other heavier stuff like a matrix server, uh, cloud storage, all that stuff, you can do that on an embassy pro because that just uses so much more. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so what's so, the So the last one, and it kind of follows on what you just saying, actually. Um, so I, I'm nomadic, you know, I don't have like a, a place where I can leave my embassy plugged in at home to c reliably connect to it. And that's an issue, for example, when I'm using my, uh, trying to interface with my lightning wallet over Zeus and hypothetical example that I've experienced, you know, you're getting your taxi from the airport in El Salvador and well, I have my embassy, but it's in my bag and I can't access my node to, to send my lightning over it because it's in my bag. Um, so have you had any thoughts about the um, cloud version? Uh, I realize, again, the trade offs there, but I mean, I think if you're going clear net, you could argue that that's, that's a, a trade off in, the, in a s different direction, but of a similar nature. Have, is there any thought about offering a cloud based service? Because for people like me, like I use Noddles one, and I find it in incredibly handy to have a reliable, obviously, it's not a sovereign, it's like having your own box in your own house, but having something that I can connect to with reliable uptime wherever I am uh, is, is a big advantage. Um, and I'm wondering if that's something you guys are considering. So you mean running Embassy OS but not being responsible for the hardware, essentially? So there'd be, uh, you'd be running on a server and I would pay you like a, a monthly amount to have an embassy that I could uh, SSH into or, or access via a browser, via a tour. It's, a, in, it's an interesting question. It's basically a business proposition. That <laughs> like we can, at the, I just want to say, first off, We've just released 033, which allows you to install. Finally, it's not limited to the Raspberry Pi. You can install on x86 hardware. That was necessary for the Pro. So that extends to saying, if you want to just install this thing on a VPS somewhere, go ahead. Uh, whether we would extend what we do to becoming hosts for you of that is potentially something we would consider. And the reason is, for the que uh, as pertinent to the questions you were asking there, building up most of the people that use us are not going to be able to review source code and they are, they are going to be essentially trusting us and trusting our community and it works for both parties if we can leverage that trust to help monetize what we do and other people can just know that there's a trusted name i mean we were even looking at being the costco of software right like we don't make the raspberry pi we don't make the embassy pro we don't make the hardware but people would come to us to buy the hardware because We've looked everywhere and we've found the most sovereign hardware there is and you can buy it from us cheaper than anywhere else. So it's, it's not like Costco make anything, right? <laughs> they just find all the best stuff and they sell it for less than anyone else. So that's kind of what we do in a, in a weird way. So yeah, I'll go for it, Chris. Uh, you make your point and then... Oh, well, you got the mic. You go first and then we'll pass it over if, to Chris. If you, guys Sorry, are, if you guys are the Costco of software, what is your equivalent of $1.50 hot dogs? Uh, I'll think about that. Let Chris make his point. The one. <laughs> yeah, the Raspberry Pi, the Embassy One, sure. Yeah, Except I, that I, keeps I, getting more expensive. <laughs> I was going to say, the, the whole point of our company, though, is that people should, host, should have their own hardware and run software on their own hardware. And so hosting things for you would be like a, sort of a, a, a last resort for us. I mean, we, we would absolutely... It's not that interesting. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah, we would absolutely... We wouldn't, but at the same time, it's not. It, it does cover some of what we offer, right? Like, if you want to just have Embassy OS and a reliable support thing, I mean, this is something we should discuss offline, but like, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have one more qu qu yeah, go for quick it. question about the, um, yeah, so like, are there, um, is there kind of like a meta level of uh, settings where you can be like, I, I am super paranoid about losing e even a dollar. What are the recommended apps? Can I get like a suite of apps from the, the whole, out of the whole store and just like one click choose that? Or if you're like, you know, I'm an enterprise company and I, I like there's certain, it seems like there's certain sets of apps that go well together and others that are more like, you know, cat pictures type things that are like just every, anything goes. Yeah. Yeah, so you're talking about bifurcation again, like the, the stuff you want really secure and the stuff you're not so concerned about? Yeah, or? like is there, well, uh, this maybe not just on the security side, but just like the collection of, like there's, I don't, I don't have time to go through every single app in the store. I don't know how many are in there, yeah, so th but they don't there's going to be like a bunch, right? And so you want to have like things uh, that are 
categorized and grouped in a way that's convenient for your... Yeah, you know. so there are groups. Um, there are groups and nothing comes installed by default, not even Bitcoin, right? So if, you're, if you don't like Bitcoin Core and you want to use an alternative implementation of Bitcoin, you can. That was always, always an essential part of what we do because over-reliance on Bitcoin Core is the greatest thing in the world and also might bite us in the ass one day, right? So we're not in a position, when you look at Umbrel, it was for the longest time, Umbrel's interface was LND. It wasn't like what we offered, which was, oh, you want Lightning? Well, what do you want to install, LND or CLN? They will both work, you can have both, you know. Um, but again, yeah, nothing comes pre-installed, right? So if you, if someone, this is the start nine marketplace, right? Which is obviously a central point of failure. If the intelligence agencies wanted to screw around and come and create problems for all of our users, this is one obvious area where they'd say, we want you to put a malicious Bitcoin in there or something like that. So we've opened it up and we've said, here it is, it's now possible to host your own marketplaces. Here's the code, here's how you do it. We want you to host your own marketplaces. If you want to run a Monero node, or if you want to blow it up by trying to run an Ethereum node, write it. Here's how you do it. We'll, we'll help you package the software up to run on Embassy. And here's how you run your own marketplace. So we are in a position where we're totally ready for people to come and say, you can't offer these services anymore. It's too controversial. Like You're allowed to be start nine. You can run Bitcoin, but you're not allowed to run Wasabi or Sparrow. That's too, that's too, you're not allowed to do that. If we did that, if that happened to us, we would just say, okay, take them off our marketplace, and they would just instantly go up on an alternative marketplace. So we've made ourselves irrelevant for the most part. The, the software is all widely available. The hardware, you know, everything about what we've written can be used outside of our ecosystem. But yeah, to get back to what you're saying, you can install what you want as and when you want. And you can recreate the packages yourself if you want to. And if you're super paranoid, it basically just becomes don't keep installing random apps. There are going to be other marketplaces that you're going to want to use because we are an operating system company. We are not in the business of packaging up apps. like. Linux devs don't sit there and make binaries for every application under the sun. It's the people that make the apps, right? Cool. So, yeah, it's yeah. like, uh, don't, it's going to become your own responsibility. Like, even on your phone, you don't install something. Guys, guys I yep. have a proposal. Uh, after the LARP, I propose a round table to keep talking about these because I am super interested. Everybody is super interested. But we are two hours behind the right. scale. And please, uh, applause, uh, claps for him. Muchas gracias. But please, after LARP, after LARP, we, we, can, we, we have a lot of questions, myself included. Cool. And oh, can I just finish by saying, please. we currently have, uh, if you go on start9.com, we currently have a bunch of offers. Uh, uh, post Black Friday, they're still up. So you can buy. Embassy Pros get a free Embassy One, which is the Raspberry Pi. You can buy them in bulk. You can do all sorts of things like that. And yeah, well, that's it. Thank you so much. I want to buy in bulk. You want to buy in bulk? Okay, yeah. come talk to me. <laughs>